Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics, and joining me today is returning guest, Tavi Costa. Tavi, how are you today? Hi, Tom. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Before the call, we were speaking about the, the state the world is in and the debt bubbles that have blown up and the fact that this has this situation has exacerbated and really brought into focus the problems that these debt bubbles have created. Could you speak to us a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, that that has been happening for some time now. The macro deterioration in general has, you know, is, is happening since 2018, 2019. Um, we saw, you know, even Japan GDP uh, having issues in the fourth quarter, which is a large economy. Obviously, we had a, a few issues with China in general, but most importantly, it was the U.S. that was at the very peak of the business cycle, while. Uh, you has you had risk on assets rising um, to levels that we've never seen before in terms of valuations. Uh, I think that has always been a problem, and that distortion is finally uh, now you know closing the gap with with uh, prices uh, falling and and trying to meet the the fundamentals. The problem is, um, you know, sometimes we have uh, triggers that that make that happen, and a lot of times we have triggers, and this time was the coronavirus and. But what's interesting is that when you go back to fourth quarter, third quarter, you can find you know a significant amount of uh, of macro indicators that were already uh, pointing to this direction uh, way before all this uh, continuing jobless claims. For for instance, on a year over year basis, it was already rising to levels similar uh, to what we saw in the in the global financial crisis. But here at Crasket, in terms of uh, of ideas uh, and overall, and we've always been uh, big believers of being long gold and being short stocks. Uh, and I know a lot of hedge funds, a lot of funds, a lot of investors are not fans of being short stocks, but we've never been uh, seen such a such a, a nice uh, setup in general uh, for for stocks on the short side, especially at a moment when, as we all know, track record for central banks to be really uh, preventing cycles from turning is is terrible. But uh, investors continue to rely on that. And in our view, equity markets are incredibly expensive today. And we've never seen uh, stocks, you know, bottom near record valuations, which is the case today. And we've seen a lot of people talking about that. We think that there's no V-shaped recovery on the horizon. And I, I think meanwhile, when you look at a list of tax stocks, for instance, you can find a ton of them trading at 20, 30, 40, even 60 times uh, sales. So it's, you know, we, we find opportunities on the REITs and consumer discretionary businesses, uh, Chinese and Hong Kong ADR and even utilities today on the short side. But the bottom line of our positioning always comes to what we call the macro trade of the century, which is being long gold, uh, if possible, in Chinese yuan terms and being short stocks. Uh, doing some research for this interview, I was learning that you guys have a lot of different models to to look at different macro indicators and, and you have a 16-factor a macro model. Could you tell us a little bit about what goes into that and what you're looking at specifically? Sure. Um, so the idea of the, of the macro model on that in that case was to, uh, number one, Kevin was always, uh, Kevin was the person who really started the fund, Crescat, um, and I just came along throughout the years and uh, what changed was that Kevin was always a value investor. He always invested in gold stocks, always had his uh, quant models to uh, to help him in his process. And what I did there was just to uh, uh, use the same uh, same ideas and, and apply macro indicators to a model that would give us a score of where we are in the business cycle. Uh, this is just one model that we thought we should be publishing, but we have plenty of others that we look at. And uh, the point is, is to search for a lot of uh, indicators that have high correlation with the changes in the business cycle and aggregate all of them and give a score, a final score. Where are we? When you aggregate, in this case, the 16-factor macro model aggregates macro indicators along with fundamental multiples and factors uh, and even technicals to kind of see the momentum uh, in things like volatility. Uh, but the, the, the actual, actually, the, uh, the indicators indicators are fairly simple. They are things that had a high correlation with the changes in the cycle. For instance, unemployment rate is one. When you look at the year-over-year -year change of that, you can see that that's, you know, when it starts rising uh, on the year-over-year -year and the delta of that is, is usually or when unemployment rate is extremely low. I mean, you can't get any better or credit spreads or yield curve inversions or you have 
P/E ratio. When you look at earnings, for instance, like P/E ratio is is a, is seen in a very perceived in a very wrong way uh, in in an investment uh, community. Uh, by the way, when you looked at that. Uh, people usually tend to say that P.E. ratios are low, uh, and that's why you should be investing in stocks. At least that was the sort of uh, case back in 2019. But that's because earnings are growing at a level that is unsustainable, first of all. And it's the same thing with margins. Those are all contrarian indicators uh, that happen to the other side. Consumer confidence is another example. Consumer confidence tends to be at its peak at the peak of the cycle. Uh, it's something, by the way, that gives us another conviction today to, to continue to be sure is that when you look at a model of consumer confidence indicators, we are not at the bottom yet. OK, I, I'm not seeing that like other people are seeing. There's not blood on the streets for the overall equity market in our view. And that model that you're referring to right now, it's at about so uh, 100 being at the very peak of the business cycle, zero being at the very bottom. Right now it's 70. So, you know, we, we think there's a lot more to go. Usually when those drops, uh, we see those drops from, um, you know, very high levels, uh, they just continue to go down uh, along with the market. And uh, that was already the case, you know, pointing us to that direction back in 2017, which gives you another thought about, you know, why your process, your investment process should never rely on one model, should always rely on you know, plenty models. Um, and I'll, I can also explain another model we built in terms of yield curve inversion that can go on on that. But that's, you know, that's the, the idea is to seek for, a, you know, a, a, and aggregate as, as, as much data as you can to, uh, to help you and guide you uh, to have a view about the markets. And but first and foremost, we're always valuing investors. This is not a systematic strategy. We use human brain uh, to create our narratives. Tavi, could you quickly explain to us why that yield curve inversion is important and and what that signals? Yes. So uh, back in 2019 or so, what we saw with the yield curve inversions was that we were trying to validate our thesis on uh, the bearish uh, uh, bias that we had. And unfortunately, a lot of the or not unfortunately, it was just a fact that at the beginning of the year of 2019, yield curve inversions were not inverted. And that is something that has a very strong track record at, at not uh, just uh, coinciding, but also uh, preceding recessions and downturns in the economy. So what we did was, OK, well, maybe the two versus stands, which are famous, the two yield versus 10 year yield or the three month versus 10 year yield are not inverted. But are, do we have other parts of the curve that are inverted? What we found is that, yes, we had close to uh, back in uh, in the beginning of the year, we we're approaching somewhere close to 50 percent. Uh, well, that research continued. You know, we continue to dig in to see how, you know, how we could you know, explore more on this. Uh, back, and then uh, approximately in August, I would say we got up to 73 percent of the yield curve was inverted. And during that period, now we saw the two versus tens and the three three month versus ten year yields inverting as well. That was a period when we had the repo crisis, when uh, the Federal Reserve started, you know, expanding its balance sheet. And the new narrative was that the the Fed, uh, you know, was holding uh, um, the hands of investors, and and things were going to be fine. Now, when you look at empirically into this research, um, the most important thing is that where, where are other times in history we've reached that 70 percent handle uh, that we reached in, back in August of 2019? Every single time we did that, uh, we actually had a recession. Sometimes it coincides with the recession and sometimes it actually preceded a recession. Um, and 08 was a great example. And there was a huge argument about this back then that the recession, you know, it would start in two years from now. And now it's being proven wrong. Um, and, and our view with the people that were relying on that two year, we're not seeing the full data because there are plenty of times in history, tech bubble being one of them, 1973, 74 being another one of those, that it coincides with the recession. But what you're really interested as a money manager is searching for what are the best assets that actually perform during periods when you reach that level of 70%. And our empirical analysis shows that if you're, especially stocks, overall stocks decline in average about 27 to 30%. 
for the next two years after you reach that handle of 70% of the yield curve invert. Um, now, when you have, you know, if you if you mix that with being long gold, and gold is is an asset that actually has performed well in some of those, and there are a few of, uh, other times in history that it didn't work well. You know, 08 was a kind of a tricky area. There are parts that it worked well and parts that it didn't. 2000, for instance, was a time that worked incredibly well. Uh, now. Now, you mix that with the fact that we have the commodities to equity ratio at a 50-year low. Every single time we had that ratio distorted historically, gold to S&P 500 ratio, in other words, being low on gold and being short stocks perform incredibly well. So I go back to what I said at the very beginning of the interview. That's the whole reason why we believe being low on gold and being short stocks will work for the next two years counting since the, that we had the, uh, the inversions reaching that level back in August of 2019. I think that's still the case. The beginning of the first lag was gold worked really well, and then stocks were melting up. And now we're seeing stocks declining. And more and more, what's going to take for central banks is that they're going to have to print more and more money. They're going to have to intervene more and more in order to uh, take, you know, help and prop up stocks uh, to another new level. And and that's going to happen. It's going to get gold going. At some point, that reliance on central banks is going to break. And when that breaks, it's when those two lags work, is when gold rises and stocks fall. And that's where we're batting on at Crescat. We believe strongly that that's going to work. Uh, I can talk a little bit about how we mix those trades. In other words, it's not just being long gold and being short to S&P. It's using models to find the most asymmetric bets we can find to be long gold and short stocks. Tavi, one would think that in this environment, with, with the Fed printing as much as it is, that everybody would lose confidence in the dollar. Are you guys still bullish on the dollar in this environment? And could you compare the the U.S. dollar to, let's say, looking at some of the risks in other currencies, such as uh, the Chinese yuan, uh, the Hong Kong dollar, or even the Canadian dollar? Yes. Um, so I will mix a little bit of the situation with our views on China, if you don't mind, because I think they're all related. Uh, we believe strongly that China and Hong Kong are two enormous bubbles and unsustainable credit bubbles. And... Credit bubbles always burst, and uh, we think that almost certainly this will always bur uh, always uh, will, but will be uh, popped as well. Uh, the virus outbreak here in this case, uh, in our view, really exposed the U.S. and China relations and has sort of unmasked uh, the CCP intentions to the world. Uh, but China has always been at the epicenter of uh, all the credit imbalances we see, and it has a $40 trillion um, banking system that is now under tremendous pressure in our view. We've seen uh, real estate investments now plunging, fixed asset, asset investments also collapsing. Uh, inflation still relatively high. Uh, cost of capital is starting to rise because of defaults. Um, so, you know, I think now more than ever, we should be looking at countries with such uh, credit imbalances and, and that have the need for dollars, right? So let's start on that idea that you're referring to. I think we're in an environment that I call a liquidity trap. And I say that because when you look at the, do the, the, the dollar loss uh, in asset value has been tremendous. In our calculation, I think we um, uh, we think that uh, the the world has lost somewhere close to 50 trillion dollars from a February uh, market top all the way down to the very bottom in March. Uh, right now, it should be uh, it should be bouncing a little bit, but it's not a lot. And when you think about that versus how much money the Fed has printed. That's not enough to get liquidity going. That's not an excess of liquidity like a lot of people are seeing, especially for the risk on asset environment. It's enough to get gold going, but it's not enough to get the dollars going. So in our view right now, um, we think that we're you know, very bullish on the dollar for Saval. But if you think about the sequence of facts that happened in 2020, first we had the RN war that we almost got into an, um, a war with Iran, and we had the virus outbreak, then we had the steep and fastest decline in stocks ever. And then we had oil trading negative, and it's just April. What's next? I think it's a dollar, it's a dollar shortage problem. And uh, you know, when I see, when I look at oil plunging and industrial commodities 
that just exacerbate the problem uh, because exports is a major source of, of dollars uh, uh, to provide dollars outside of the U.S. And that's now collapsing. And that, in our view, uh, you know, the, the problem with the dollar shortage here is, is that it could cause some, some major you know, currency packs to break. Uh, the candidates, in our view, are Hong Kong dollar and, and the Chinese uh, yuan. Um, we think that we are sort of in a global synchronized basement in which gold has been performing well relative to almost every currency in the world today. Um, and that's probably going to continue, right? We just saw, uh, for instance, the PBOC assets or the Fed assets actually surpass the PBOC assets. It shows that the PBOC is being limited. They're not being able to print as much money as the Fed, perhaps because of a problem with the dollar. Um, and, and they don't want to, you know, they, they, they can't really accelerate the problem with their currency. So that's our view on that, on that side. But Hong Kong itself suffers it, its own banking, political and currency problem in our view. It's, it's a financial gateway to China, if you think about it. And when you combine the two, they're the biggest credit bubble we've seen in the world today. Um, and so, you know, we think that this the situation with the Chinese Communist Party taking over Hong Kong, it, it really has dismantled uh, their democracy and destroyed their status as an, as an international banking haven. Um, and we think this is only going to continue. That causes capital outflows from from Hong Kong. Um, and you know, when you have a situation in which your you know private non financial uh, credit market is 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 somewhere close to 300 percent to GDP, and you are on the you know the BIS crisis watch list, uh, you know this is a big issue. Uh, is does Hong Kong have enough? Uh, to really um, to really uh, avoid a collapse like this, and that's usually when you see those currency crises, um, uh, when you have what we call the uh, the twin crisis, when it's a currency and a credit collapse. It's because usually you have a credit problem, it's a banking problem, it's outflows that cause the issue, and then and then as as a as a central bank, you're trying to rescue the economy, but you. You can't rescue it too much, otherwise you cause a break in the currency. At some point, they have to, you know, they have to uh, to save one or the other. And at a lot of times in history, we see both falling apart uh, because of the confidence in investors is gone, and outflows causes issues in both the currency and the equity markets, the banking system, and everything collapses. And what we call the the twin crisis. There is a very high probability that that could happen. The way we're playing this is when you look throughout history. Is that gold uh, uh, is 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 an important asset, but most important is that gold in 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 local currency terms is even more important. So back to your question, we're bullish on the dollar, we're bullish on gold too, but we're bullish. So that if if you look at that mathematically, we look we're long gold in renminbi terms. In other words, we're long gold and we're short the Chinese currency. We're long gold and we're short the Hong Kong dollar. If we're wrong on this. This just means we're long gold in dollar terms. Those currencies are pegged. So it just adds another asymmetry to the trade in terms of the issues that we're seeing with the dollar shortage problem. Perfect, Tavi. That that makes a lot more sense that you're long gold and then short the renminbi, as you say, in, in local currency terms. Um, obviously, all this makes a, a even stronger bullish case for gold and silver, correct? Yes, uh, we have never been uh, so bullish uh, in terms of that with with uh, with gold and, um, and and silver. I think it's important to always uh, go back to what's happening in, in the world today. You know, when you look at uh, interventions of, of of central banks, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of history, but this level of intervention that we're seeing is it's kind of unprecedented. Um, and but there is one country we can look back, which is Japan. So the BOJ assets, when you look at the balance sheet that they have relative to the stock market that they have uh, in terms of market cap size, uh, it's right now somewhere close to 108, 106 percent. So they have much more assets in their balance sheet that they that their market, the market cap of their equity market is worth. But you know, in the U.S. today, we're somewhere close to 20 percent on that ratio. Now, when you look at Japan, it, Japan was in the in the U.S. situation. In other words, it was at 20 percent on that ratio back in September of 2008. Since then, when you look at that. 
you can see that what's what's causing that issue is that when you look at the performance of equity markets in Japan, it's not like they have been booming. Equity markets have perhaps up about, uh, if I remember, 17 percent since that uh, September of 08. Uh, and at the same time, what we're seeing is that when you compare that with gold in, in Japanese yen terms, it's actually uh, more than uh, doubles up 120 uh, percent since that period. It, another reason for you to buy gold and sell stocks. But what we have in terms of the policies in the U.S. is even more important here because um, over half of the of the of the intervention by the Federal Reserve has been to buy treasuries. In other words, that brings interest rates lower. Right. It's been it's been mostly to buy long term treasuries. Uh, and, and or at least uh, more the, the 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 back end of the curve as well. So and at the same time as you have you know things like you know, when you look at the tips, uh, when you look at tips yield curve is completely inverted. In our view, when you look at that with the dilution of money happening already in the U.S. And you look at that Ill illiquidity issue that I was talking about, which was referring to the liquidity trap problem that we think they're going to have to print a lot more money than two to three trillion dollars to really help. You know, the losses of an asset value of, you know, of 50, 30, whatever trillion it is, which is much higher than two to three trillion dollars that they have printed. Um, that is an explosive combination, not for stocks, but for gold itself. And on top of that is, is always it comes down to that question. I mean, who is going to bail out whom, right? Uh, we are seeing government deficits relative to GDP exploding to the upside. And it's another reason for you to own gold because people are going to be questioning that more and more. We are in this process. There's a lot of reliances on central banks in general that we see. And one of them that haven't broken yet is the one with the equity markets. Everyone thinks that the central banks will continue to and perhaps even buy stocks and that will prop up stocks. In our view, that's not going to happen uh, because of the asset value loss. You can see that in 08. 08, we saw money printing happening throughout the whole crisis and that never prevented the crisis from happening. So that's more of the, the, the issue there. And I think gold is only going to, when you look at the, the relation of commodities to equity ratio I was referring to, that's another reason for you to own gold. Gold is extremely over, uh, undervalued, especially relative to the monetary base globally. So I think it's... It, it's time if you're if you're not owning gold in your portfolio today, I think you're being irresponsible in, in a way. So I, I couldn't agree more, Tavi. Um, as as we're talking about owning gold in our po portfolio, how do you think about splitting that up? Do you do you spread it between ETFs, miners, physical? How how do you guys go about that? So we have a mix. Um, uh, we have. Um, we have a few uh, through. Uh, we have a gold, silver, and platinum positions. Uh, we hold those in the futures uh, market, which is something that is now uh, very controversial, especially with what's happening in the oil market, uh, which I think a, a lot of it does not actually apply to gold. Uh, there's there is actually. Uh, uh, it's actually quite the opposite in terms of that. There's an excess of oil. <laughs> There's not an excess of gold here. Um, so it's quite the opposite situation that a lot of people are linking in the wrong way. Historically, that also follows, you know, gold prices very close. So we're pretty comfortable with that position. But also, you know, if, if for people that are worried about that in the futures market, look at miners. I mean, miners uh, is the whole reason why miners perform so well during the Great Depression. Back in 1929 or so, miners did really well during that period, and I think that that could be an option here. You know, that's that's actually a uh, another part of the the long mix that we have in the portfolio today, and and it's mostly you know we handpicked about 40 to 50 stocks uh, through our investment process. Uh, you know, it's it's by you know valuing uh, jurisdiction, how safe that is, good management, are the projects very valuable? Do they have interesting geological patterns? Uh, we do a lot of the diligence on on the early discoveries and juniors, and we think that that's where the most potential really is. When you look at the juniors right now, they have actually lagged some of the seniors, uh, which in your view is is an opportunity. There's a lot of catch up to happen on that, and we find you know a lot of juniors trading at at truly historic valuations, you know, there some of those guys are trading at with a 10, 20, even 50 percent for cash flow yield. Um, so, you know, the precious metals miners is still a large majority of our longs in a portfolio. Uh, and when you look at the, you know, the whole idea of the V-shaped recovery, I mean, the only V-shaped recovery that is happening is in gold prices and now miners. 
Uh, look at miners. They're already higher than what they were prior to a few months ago before that 40, 50 percent drop. Some of those stocks are down 60 or 70 percent. That was stunning to us. And that 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 for me was the real blood on the streets, not the overall equity market, but precious metal stocks. And I think I think that's still an opportunity. It's still it's still something. It's the only industry in the world, if you think about it, that actually benefits from all this uh, monetary experiment that we're seeing worldwide. Uh, and it's actually one of the few industries in the world that not only benefits from that, but is also trading at 1980s levels. Name one other industry that is in the same situation that actually benefits from this, and I can't find one. And if you do, let me know. But that's the only one that I know that it does well during those periods. And when you look at things like cash on the sidelines, which I think it's important to point out, you know, when you look at, for instance, uh, money market funds, uh, which mostly are in retirement funds in general, uh, 401k plans and all those, uh, what, we, what you find there is is that there is about 4.5 or so trillion dollars uh, parked in that in those funds. And uh, that's essentially your cash on the sidelines. It's about, what, 15 percent or so of the total market cap in the U.S., for those that are thinking, oh, this is bullish for equity market, that's not because actually, in a way, it got up to 50 percent. Now, think about this proportion right now. It's about four point five trillion dollars sitting in the cash and on, on, on the sidelines there on those money market funds. Well, a lot of that money, if you only take four percent of that, you buy the entire gold and silver industry in, in Canada and the U.S., I mean, that's that's insane to think about that. Only four percent of all that money buys the entire industry of 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 gold and silver. One of uh, the only industry that I know that benefits from all this uh, insanity that we're seeing in, in with central banks and governments. So, you know, I couldn't stress more how uh, or stress enough how bullish I am. And we are in terms of uh, of, of, of this uh, of this whole industry. Uh, we are mostly focused on the juniors and early discoveries and a few seniors. Uh, I think as you get more to the later um, uh, phases of this, what we view as a secular bull market for gold, uh, we will go back and start looking at more of the royalties and even more uh, seniors uh, in going forward. Tabby, are you guys looking at any leveraged ETFs right now? And if so, what are the risks associated with those? Yeah, I don't have a ton of insights in terms of risk associated with those specifically, because I think the risk associated with those is similar to the risks associated with any ETF that has, you know, uh, holdings that are not liquid enough versus the liquidity of the actual ETF. Uh, the problem is, you know, is, is the whole idea of make money fast. And that's not how it works in any industry, any any sustainable uh, uh, thesis uh, of, of, of actually growing capital. And unfortunately, a lot of people have been, uh, you know, caught up into those uh, highly leveraged uh, products that will not end up well. And I think that was a huge part of the problem that also exacerbated the, the decline uh, that we saw back in, you know, a month or so ago uh, during this uh, steepest and fastest decline in equity markets we've ever seen. So, now, unfortunately, I think that that's uh, that's that's what it has to do with, and I and I I personally I hope I hope that that's uh, those products go away. Uh, I don't think they serve any any good for uh, for investors in general. I think those are bad products, um, but you know I I also I also think that they should go away on their own, uh, and hopefully people will realize that. Unfortunately, they won't. Unfortunately, most of the people that actually got. Uh, got sucked into that kind of investment idea is are the retail investors that are trying to, you know, make a quick buck, and and that's usually not you no know, never ends well as we all know. So uh, ETFs, I mean, you can see the same issue with junk bonds, right? I mean, junk bonds have the same. When you look at junk bonds, ETFs, or even investment grade ETFs, they they present the same problem. You know, liquidity. They're very. They have very illiquid holdings, and compared to the liquidity of the ETF itself. And, you know, if, if you have a large drop in those ETFs, it can cause some real problems and uh, large gaps that we're seeing in things like, you know, the oil market today. You know, uh, who would have thought that the oil market would be so impacted by an ETF? <laughs> and it was. Uh, so anyways, I, I think that that's uh, that's all uh, kind of linked. And unfortunately, uh, you know, that poses an opportunity if we do have any ETFs like that going bust. And yeah, I mean, uh, or going away. I think we should be. Uh, 
uh, taking advantage of uh, of of the mar- of the of the sell off that might be caused by them them being forced to sell those securities. Uh, I think that that only creates opportunity. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of those. We don't hold any of those uh, leveraged uh, ETFs in our funds, and I don't suggest anybody to do so. Perfect, uh, Tavi. Do you see us possibly getting a, another pullback in gold uh, to cover some of these oil losses? I think it's possible, uh, even though I do think that that's, um, you know, like I said, you know, the people like to measure my opinion sometimes uh, on social media and anything like that uh, in terms of one or two investment ideas. But instead, measure this uh, as the ratio that I was referring to, which is I think that's the best way to profit and, and protect capital from this downturn in the cycle. I don't know when gold is gonna work or when the shorts are gonna work in terms of being long gold and being short stocks. But I, I, I have I have a strong uh, conviction that uh, that ratio will work for the next uh, year and a half or so at least. Uh, it could work tremendously in, in one or two months and it might change my mind. But my plan for now is for the next year or so to have that position and then evaluate again and see where we are. Um, in terms of silver, especially, is the one that probably moves the most along with the markets. Um, and it could, yeah, we could see a, a pullback on those. And I think those pullbacks are opportunities. And, and it's not the end of the world uh, like they were back in, um, in in March as well in, in February. I think that, that we should be seeing this as, a, as, a, as an opportunity. Really, that's the real buy the dip opportunity, not the equity markets, in my view. But there's a moment, you know, if you look at Back in like the Great Depression, for instance, there are moments when uh, there is a disconnect between the miners and the stock market in general, um, and the stock market overall starts falling apart, but actually miners uh, continue to rise. Uh, so there are parts of that lag of being long gold and short stocks that, that actually those two lags begin to work together, and that's where you really uh, you know have the, the most uh, prolific times of that ratio um, throughout history. So I think I think that that could uh, that could happen. I mean, we're still, you know, recently. So if you think about rebalancing the portfolio, you know, if we had a big run in, 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 in uh, precious metals, which was the case recently, uh, we start adding to we, we, we start adding to our shorts. So that's essentially what we do back. Um, why? Because your shorts, you know, our equity markets have rebounded significantly. So now the shorts are starting to look more attractive. Now, back in March, we came out with a letter saying blood on the streets for precious metals. Well, that was the whole idea was that uh, our ratio, part of it worked, right? Well, the, we actually made a lot of money uh, on shorting stocks, but we didn't make money on the precious metal side. Overall, we actually made money. So the, the shorts actually offset the losses on the precious metals in a huge way. However, that was an opportunity for us. We covered some of the shorts and we bought some of precious metals. So we've been doing kind of that, you know. If we see a big swing in one of part of one one of those lags, uh, we tend to uh, uh, to do the opposite and, and and rebalance the portfolio that way. Perfect, Tavi. On on your guys's website, you have uh, lots of very informative charts and an excellent quarterly letter. You're very active on Twitter as well. Would you like to share some of those? Sure thing, yeah, um, yeah. I've been trying to be more active on Twitter. I think it's is important. Uh, one of the things we haven't done in the past was to really expose ourselves to the media and and share our views more frequently. And I think we've been trying to uh, completely change that. Uh, at least uh, Kevin and I. So um, yes, uh, so our website is crescat.net. Uh, we, we we know we put out our letters uh, very uh, very often, and it's uh, we go very in depth on a lot of our, our views that I just I was just referring to. Usually, it's about one of the the, the three topics about the macro trade of the century, uh, which is being long gold in remembi terms and being short global stocks. And we say global just because it's general. There are some Canadian ADRs. There's some uh, Hong Kong and I'm sorry, not Canadian ADRs, Hong Kong stocks, um, Canadian stocks. There's some Hong Kong and Chinese ADRs um, or utility stocks. So we have a very different view than I would say most other shops. Um, and uh, or my Twitter, I usually put at least a chart a day there. Sometimes it's even three, depending on the day. Uh, sometimes I'm lucky I find more charts and I, I put out because I think that that's all part of the thesis you're always trying to validate your thesis and make sure you're in the right place and and, you know we work intensely doing that and a lot of times i find interesting charts and i want to put out as uh as as a way to uh, to share our views and uh, my twitter is at tabi costa 
Um, and uh, so if you enjoy those, uh, those, those charts, follow me. I think I will continue doing that. <laughs> And of course, that's C-R-E-S-C-A-T dot net, correct? Yes, you're right. Good point. <laughs> Excellent, Tavi. Great to have you back. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Tom. Always a pleasure. Thank you. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?